Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m., Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. It's finally time to talk about that movie that's set a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Join us for a very special episode celebrating the film that started it all, at least for the four of us. Star Wars. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast. Dean Legiro here with you behind the microphone. Eric, say hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello. How are you? How are we doing? <clears throat> We're doing good. We've got some special guests with us. Uh, these guys seem to come in pairs recently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't know there was like a Goodfellas Star Wars connection, but it, it is here and it is real. So we've got Nick Leshy with us as well. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And of course, Sean Grady, the uh, the Uber I'm going to put him in the Uber realm because he was just pulling out his Darth Vader action figure case that is in like mint. I think he puts turtle wax on it or <laughs> something because it's in mint, like shiny condition. And his figures are like, like pristine as well. So welcome, Sean. Hey. He's true. He's true hey, blue. True blue. Welcome, Absolutely. Welcome. So yep. we're going to, yeah, you know what? I mean, every, I'm sure everybody that's done a, a movie podcast has probably done Star Wars. So, don't expect any revelations uh, about the film. Uh, you know, we're, we're more going to speak about it, you know, what, what we enjoyed about it, what impact it had on us. So you're certainly not going to get a whole lot of plot. I mean, I think my sister might be the only person that has still never wow. seen Star Wars. I don't think she's ever seen it, um, I'm which, is sorry, which is fine. You know, I'm kind of jealous of somebody that gets to see it for the first time. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of that have and, you know, but uh, as far as I know, like, at this point, yeah, I think as far as I know, my son-in-law hasn't seen any of the films either. Yeah. So, um, which is it's shocking, shocking to me, which is you know. still out there. There's a few. Yeah, I still there, think this so. should be the first one. You called it Star Wars instead of Star Wars, a new hope. I mean, that's the way we remember it. That's how it was. Yeah, absolutely. Released. Uh, well, yeah. there so, you go. It was, it was not, it was not a new hope. It was just Star Wars. And I just wonder mm -hmm. people who are exposed to Star Wars. I really think this should be their first one. You know, they really should see episode four. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm always curious if they see Mandalorian first, if they've seen the cartoons, if they've seen the prequels um, yeah. or, you know, the, the, the Disney sequels. Um, but it really, this one should be the first one for anyone. It, it's, it's very difficult nowadays, just with the glut of product that's out there, right? Yeah. Between video games, between animated series, now with Disney plus, Mm -hmm. The films, Rogue One, I mean, you you almost nowadays can just stumble into a Star Wars film, uh, you know, no pre pre the the prequel trilogies. It was pretty much. Yeah, you had three films and, and you had the droids cartoon series. You had the Ewoks cartoon series and, and you didn't really have a whole lot after that. You had comics. Mm -hmm. But nowadays with with the media, it's pretty much everywhere. So it'd be very difficult, I think, for somebody to. And especially when it's called, like you, Nick, you said they, they should start with episode four. <laughs> right. So you're telling them to start in the middle, but because normally one, you would right? start, you would start at episode one, but in this mm -hmm. case, no, you really shouldn't start at episode one. And I always wonder if he had never made sequels, like if this was just a standalone, a really weird part of that serial storytelling that he wanted, like, you know, with the serial stories, the adventure yeah. stories yeah. of the old days, um, it would have just been this like curiosity. But um, yeah, it would have been like a sort of an experimental film. Yeah, type. I would have filled in the backstory yeah. and what happened next. But mm -hmm. um, it, of course, made so much money that, of course, they were going to do sequels. Of course, it became this franchise and this behemoth. Yeah. So. Well, I, I think he, I think honestly he shot himself in the foot way back, way back, way back when 
you know, there was the thing, oh, I have, you know, these other movies and this other, you know, prequels and sequels and stuff like that. And I think he put the onus on himself to, because he mentioned it and then people never like let that quote go or those statements go. And it's kind of yeah. like, oh yeah, you said you had three before and three more <clears> after and, you know, and, and he walked away from it for such a long time and then decided to do the, the, the prequel trilogy. But, and I think that was more like he was pressured into do Like, I think it was more like the pressure was like unbearable. Like you said, you were going to do these and it, it what might've been an offhand comment in 77 or 78. Yeah. Became like gospel to the fans of, well, you have to, you got to do these. Well, and he had a story them. mapped out. Right. I mean, but yeah. the story that he had was virtually unrecognizable to what we got, in, 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 especially when it comes to the sequels, you know, for Empire and Jedi, they, they, they resembled nothing of what I think he was planning to do. But uh, I think I said, I think he said that if, if Star Wars didn't work, he was going to do essentially Splinter of the Mind's Eye. I don't know if you guys remember that novel remember that came that. out yeah. right after the I film written by Alan Dean Foster, yep. who ghost wrote the novelization of the film. Lucas didn't write it. He, I, he got him to do it. But he said that that's the story he would have told if Star Wars, you know, tanked at the box office. He was going to put that on television, mm. make uh -huh. that for tell tell that story on TV. That, that would have been, cool. been interesting. Yeah. That would have been it was a good novel. Really odd, <laughs> but yeah, it was. it was a good novel. But yeah, all right. Let let's get let's get rolling with the show proper because we've already taken an off ramp. But that's okay. There'll probably <laughs> be a lot of off ramps. Uh, <laughs> yeah. None will lead to Alderaan, though. No. <laughs> oh, too soon. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. So <laughs> let's let's give some stats for those that that are not familiar with the story uh, or the film. It was released on May twenty fifth of nineteen seventy seven. Written and directed by George Lucas, had an eleven million dollar budget and uh, seven hundred and seventy five million dollar box office. The recipient of six Oscars: art direction, costume design, film editing, original score. Best sound and visual effects. Not best picture, not best director, not screenplay. No actors were recognized. It was all technical, uh, mm. technical awards, which was kind of a snub. I think if we looked back, it might, you know, it might have changed. So let's let's start with with I want to start with Sean. Let's do it. And and when did you when did you first see this? What was the story? What was the story of you and your first your first viewing? Now, I know I was three years old when it came out, and I know I saw it in the movie theater. I believe it was re-released a couple of times, right, after, after that in the 70s? Yeah. So if I didn't see it when I was three, I definitely think I saw it the following year when I was four. I saw it with my dad. It was the first movie I ever saw, and I definitely remember feeling something like, what is that? Like, this is amazing. Like – you know, the X-Wing fighters, the TIE fight, Darth Vader, you know, he comes down, the presence, Luke Skywalker, the lightsaber, everything. It it changed my life. And my, my childhood, when I think back, I don't think of it. I, it's Star Wars. Star Wars pretty much defined my childhood from age four till I was like 10 or, or it, every Star Wars. I mean, it blew me away. I remember it. I think we saw it again. I def, We definitely saw it twice in the theater. I, I couldn't get enough Star Wars. My It was Star Wars it was everything to me after I saw that movie. So I was really young. It like definitely had an impact on my life. It, the figures, the, the sh I had sheets. I, I mean, we won't get into all this stuff, but I had ev ev everything had to be Star Wars from that point on. And I, I my dad took me to see Darth Vader. Um, he was at the Bazaar Mall. And, oh. and I my dad always said like, I, I remember your face when you saw Darth Vader come from behind the curtain and I have a picture of it still. And the mask was great, but like, I guess that centerpiece of Darth, it was, it's not great. <laughs> it's like, it, it does not even look anything close to what it really was, but I was probably just looking at, it. and I got a lightsaber in my hand that looks like a plastic lightsaber. It's not great either, but I was four. And to me, that was Darth Vader. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, it just, like I said, it changed. It shaped my whole childhood, Star Wars. Awesome. Awesome. Nick, Nick, what about you? Same as Sean. Um, I was seven, right? So 77. 
Now, I don't remember if it was the exact because that was when they left them running in the theaters for like for months and months and yeah. like said they re-released it i know i saw it before empire came out and um it wasn't the first movie i went to see because my dad took me to see a burt reynolds movie i think it was hooper um because i remember a naked lady popping out of a cake and my dad covering my eyes but um yeah. he, you know wow. he, and I, he and i were he and i were star trek fans we watched that in tv and i remember yeah we went there and he loved westerns he didn't really get into it as much as he liked Star Trek. But I remember it, we walked in and the movie had already been playing because back then you could just walk into a theater mid-show, right? And then you could stay and watch it again when they played it again. Like they wouldn't like <laughs> kick you out of the theater or make you show your ticket again. And I think that's where so many of us in my generation you know, saw it like a hundred times or whatever because they just stayed in the theater all Saturday and Sunday and just mm-hmm. watched it like four or five times, then went back the next day. And then, you know, it played again and you're like, okay, this is where we came in and you'd walk out. <laughs> but like Sean said, it just kind of, that was the movie that opened my eyes to storytelling. It was, it was the kind of stories I love, the science fiction stories and the adventure stories, but done in a realistic way. You look at it now and you see the campiness of it and the cheesiness of the dialogue and stuff like that. But it was still done genuinely. And from the beginning, from that, you know, the screen, Star Wars popping up, it just grabbed my attention and it changed cinema forever you know i mean jaws was a big blockbuster before that but star wars was what really brought in ushered in the kind of movies that came in afterwards for good and bad right yeah you know what you you make a i was thinking about jaws earlier and it's it's so funny nick because i was thinking about like the tentpole movies and like the blockbusters and the reason why star wars was more impactful is because Jaws was a, a phenomenon, but also people didn't want to go see it because yeah. of how, fr- like the pa- the the genuine panic that occurred, um, and that w- it wasn't a film for children. I, now I'm going to say later, I'll say it now. I don't think Star Wars is a ch- is a kids film, but it was a film that children could go see. But Jaws, yeah. on the other hand, it, it made a ton of money despite like the 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 subject matter. And the fact that people were, you know, back then would be considered probably more of a horror film just because of of, of the way it was presented. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Jaws was kind of like set the table, but it wasn't the right product to hit everybody, you know, and, and this seemed to be closer to it. So, uh, Eric, yeah, what about it? You and Star <clears throat> Wars. Me and Star Wars. When did you um... meet? <laughs> well, like, like Nick, you know, I pretty much grew up on television as well star trek you know big fan uh so maybe i think the only movies i had seen in the theater up to that point was uh escape from the planet of the apes <sighs> and i think a disney film it might have been pinocchio uh i'm not sure but yeah but i i, I you know I, we didn't really get to go to the movies all that often and i, I saw it when i was 11 so yeah, it had such a, a great, a great impact. You know, I remember seeing it at the Central Plaza in Yonkers and Central Avenue. Um, and when we when we got there, my parents and my sister, uh, it was sold out. Uh, of course, because we, you know, of course, we didn't look into it. We, you know, you, you really couldn't. At the, wait, you at, didn't you didn't get days. the tickets out? You didn't get the tickets online? No, <laughs> you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you 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 took Fandango? your chances. You went, and we we got there, and it, yeah, there was a huge line, of course, and it was sold out. And uh, yeah, I made my parents wait, and we, we waited for three hours for the next show because you had to stand in line to get the t- you couldn't buy the tickets and then and then leave and come back you had to you had to stay there to get the you know to stand in line and have your place in line because they weren't selling the tickets yet so we would like rotate out because luckily there were stores that you can go into there was a pizza joint there there was a, an ice cream parlor i think i'm pretty sure and so we took turns like standing in line waiting for the next show because i refused to go home i, I was just like no I, I have to see this so <laughs> Yeah, so we, you know, we all loved it, and it was great, and it was just, yeah, I mean, it was everything you guys just pretty much said. It opened the door for a whole new level of storytelling, and you know, most of the films that I had seen like were on television. Like I was a huge King Kong fan; that was like my, my favorite film, the Thirty Three Kong, when I was like five, and then you know, then there was the Wizard of Oz, and I kind of, it almost was as if as if those two films were like combined. Cause it had the, you know, some grittiness to it and, and darkness to it, but there was also this wondrous 
fairy tale, basically this very simplistic hero's journey, you know, from beginning to end. And you, and he, and you know, the good guys won and then, you know, the bad guys lost and, and that was great. And that was, you know, but the technical aspect of it was what really, really captured me. You know, like I was just amazed at the, the effects. I'd never seen anything like, like that before the, the pacing of the film, the way it was, you know, all, every, all the ships moved and, and just, you know, just the character designs and, you know, it was just, you know, the world building of this thing was the, was the, was the key factor, I think for, for all of us. Yeah. So, Absolutely. so yeah. I hadn't met Eric yet. Um, yeah. we would meet probably uh, maybe a year, a and year a half later, later yeah. or so, yep. give or take. I had seen, I think the sting in the theater. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> why at the time i was like seven <laughs> did you understand I, it i, I did yeah. i did um and i think i saw like towering inferno but but the thing is okay. i lived in dobbs ferry new york and i lived on main street which is literally in the center of town and around the corner on cedar street was a was a movie theater the pickwick theater so yeah. i had access to a, a movie theater at all times now the the thing about it was is that it was such a small movie theater and back then uh like like I think Nick said like you, you it didn't you know there wasn't a lot of prints of the film so not every theater got Star Wars even if they wanted it it yeah. went to all the big theaters first and then once they had their run of it it would go to the smaller theaters so I was chomping at the bit cuz my parents weren't going to take me to Central Avenue or whatever because there was a theater around the corner literally it's like what you know what what would be the point of that so I had action figures. I had the trading cards. Um, I had the story of Star Wars, the record, narrated by Roscoe Lee Brown. And that yeah. was all I had. I, I I knew the story before I ever saw the movie because I just used to listen to the record and look at the pictures. So I was like immersed in the in into something that I hadn't seen yet. But everybody around me had seen it, friends, everybody was going Star Wars crazy. And I'll never forget it. It's it's I can I can recall it now. It's burned into my memory because I think I don't know if it was every Tuesday or Wednesday the theater would change the movie. You'd get the new movie and then it'll be ready for the weekend. And I remember walking up Main Street and just turning the corner onto Cedar Street and looking up and seeing the marquee, and all it said was Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. And I knew I was like. That must have been great. Now yeah. it like and I can remember it. The red, the red plastic, clear plastic lettering that they used on the marquee, and it just said Star Wars, and that was all it needed to say. And it was fi- it was like finally. And then, like Nick said, I think it was like a buck fifty or whatever it was. But go to the two o'clock show. You're still there at the eight o'clock show. <laughs> like wow. we just, I saw Greece like five times that way. Like I would just like you could just sit there. You you, you slink down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they sweep up. The they, they didn't, yeah, they didn't care. And and it, it was on like Donkey Kong. I just stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed. And it was, I, I guess, at the right age for it. I was a big Planet of the Apes fan, so I was mm. kind of already you know because that was like the big that was like the the big franchise for kids or or for sci fi was like Planet of the Apes in the seventies. Yeah. It really wasn't some anything that was kind of out there. You know, a lot, everything else was kind of corny, a little cheesy, and that even you know started to skirt the skirt the the edges of corniness. And and then when this came out, it like like Eric said, and it, it's just like re, it was realistic. You know, yeah. it wasn't like like the ha- schlocky hammer horror with like really you know tempera paint blood red. You know, it was a, it was a, and that's why I say it's not for kids because it was it, it took itself seriously. It wasn't targeting for children per se i'm gonna keep i'm gonna keep saying that i don't think it Mm was i think it was making a science fiction film that appealed to all ages because it's got a lot of like you said eric said a lot of dark themes aunt baru and and uncle owen i mean they got smoked i mean they're like like smoldering smoldering skeletons that's not kid (laughs) stuff no it's not and yeah it it does have a, a sort of uh there is a tension that's building up, right? There's, there's that ongoing dark cloud, you know, there's like, there's this foreboding happening as the journey progresses. Right. So it gets, you know, yeah, aggressively darker, but, but it's, it's told in that way. It's told in that very sort of fast, you know, and loose way that I guess the old story, you know, classic Hollywood films were, or, or even the, the, you know, the cheesy 
serials. I don't know if you guys yeah. ever seen any of that stuff. I mean, my dad, absolutely. yeah, absolutely recognized it when the minute that you know, he started watching, he goes, "I, I know, I've seen this. This is, I know what this is." You know, yeah. like I, I saw those old Flash Gordon serials, and he, he goes, "I know exactly what the." Yeah, what and that's the direct. About. That's the direct yeah. line. Is he and, tried yeah. to get? He tried to get the rights for Flash Gordon. And the him story and, line, Francis, exactly. It was just I think yeah, Coppola, Francis. Yeah, I think Francis Ford Coppola went with him uh, in, mm-hmm. in a couple of the meetings when he tried to acquire the rights to Flash Gordon, and he couldn't get it. So he said, "Okay, I'll I'll write my own. I'll make my own. Right. I'll make I'll make my own version of it." So, Sean, did you have like the Star Wars T shirt as well? You said you said the sheets. I had. I mean, I had ed- everything. I, I mean, I I was you know I remember getting my first Star Wars figure. It was Darth Vader. I my, my mom was into shra- ceramics. It was the late seventies. She like I had a ceramic like Star Wars Death Star clock that she made me. Wow. Uh, a, an R two D two like that she made me. My dad put a, a blinking light. And it was like my night light. I, I mean, the the book. I, I had a book. I had. The Miko Disco Star Wars song, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, coloring books, like a pillow. I I I couldn't get enough Star Wars. I I I, I you know what's funny? I don't re- remember having a T-shirt though. I, I remember having all that other stuff, but I don't think I had a T-shirt. I had a poster up on my wall. Anything Star Wars, I ate it up. I I, I oh yeah um, yeah. You know, and and like you said, like my dad enjoyed the movie and and was into it. Like it's like something like a memory I have of my dad. Like he watched. And he was into it. Like my dad was definitely into Star Wars, like I was. So yeah. that was cool, you know. So it, it, it definitely, it definitely was something that we, you know, we shared um, as a family, which was so which was cool. What what made you hang on to all your figures? You know, I I, I just couldn't get. You've got a lot there, right? I, I mean, I do, and I have some of the. I still I have the ad ad up there, and I, you know, and some things are missing pieces. Still bothers me to this day. <laughs> how that happened i told you i i had a, a we had a dog that chewed a bunch of my figures which that was heartbreaking as well you know things get lost but i just i just can't i couldn't let couldn't let them go they just there's a lot of memories attached to that it's like it's amazing and eric you'll appreciate this because I, I i know you you're, you could be an emotional guy but <laughs> i've been I listening rip. and and now when i hear that last song I'm, I'm tearing up. I'm well, yeah. like it's, I, it, it, I'm like, I didn't ever used to make me cry. It, it gets me every yeah. time. Of and, course. And I, Cause I'm yeah. old and star Wars, you experience as a kid. Then you experience it. Like when it came back in the special editions, you had a different, and now I'm a father. It's like, it's, i you learn something new about it and you have a different experience with it. And it, I don't know, it just elicits a lot of emotion. So I can't get rid of the stuff. I just can't get rid of it. It's, <laughs> It's, it's a part, part of you. It's part of it. Tra- it. it transcends the generations, which was which which was Lucas's intention from the very yeah. beginning to to have generations of people love this this thing. And man, you know, yeah, he he had the vision. You know, matter what you no matter what you say about the guy, whether he's a great filmmaker or not, um, you know that that that's debatable. I guess, and I guess yeah. certain people, you know, because he did make some. <laughs> You know, some questionable stuff, but but with this thing, I, I think he had the the vision, and and he knew exactly what it would be, and nobody at that time did. And everybody totally, was like all his right, friends. About the vision, though, like he held on to the, the yeah. merchandising rights, and he held That's on right. to yeah. You yeah. Know, he you know he as part of his deal, you know he he created this uh, special effects empire, right? You know, yeah, back yeah. Then. He created ILM. So, Nick, Nick, what did you have? Did you have any any of those? You still I have had, anything or not? I had the action figures, but I I destroyed them. I played with them every day. They got you know. <laughs> See, Sean is a collector. <laughs> I don't know how you kept them in pristine. Yeah. I did play shape. with them. I swear, I, I played know. with them. I, I, I had from I had other action figures from other franchises. Like I remember I had yeah. Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica and oh, his yeah. arm his arm oh, yeah. fell off. But I kept, you know, I used that as part of my storytelling. I was like, you know, he got, you know, Darth Vader like tortured him and ripped out. Sorry, like, yeah, any, any, <laughs> any, any, cross franchise. Cross the streams. <laughs> any, anytime anytime there was some kind of other like alien or something, I, I used to, you know, just include it. Yeah, the, you yeah. know, in the, the in micro dots you know. paired well because they I were also, around the same size. I, I I didn't have a lot of the toy. I had the figures. I didn't care for. I didn't like the ships. I remember because I, I guess I was old enough to realize that they just weren't. They didn't look right to me. scale. They weren't to no. But 
but you look at the Falcon, like when the Falcon came out, like the cockpit of that thing was huge and it wasn't proportionate with the rest of the ship. Yeah. It always bothered me. Like I, I just never wanted that. I was like, it doesn't look right to me. I don't, I don't want, don't spend the money. I don't want that. And, and the, the TIE fighter was like, so high. Like I yeah, think a lot of those things are just pushed out. Like they didn't the really wings, like the quality control wasn't that great. Probably. You yeah. know, I, like, the wings were yeah. too short. The X wing was not tall enough. It didn't have the landing skid like in the movie. It wow. was like low to the Eric, ground. Eric it was, was going all spec it was on this. Too, like, yeah, I, I just none of that stuff looked right to me. So I didn't have. I only had, I think, Luke's Lance speeder, and I had. I, I remember having the troop transport, which was never seen. I had that. I had in it. The films and they sh- and the Mandalorian. That's the yes. first time you actually see it. That was an Easter. Driving, yeah, when they're driving that that thing over the cliff, and you know, like yeah. And you press and the then, buttons, and C three PO would talk, and then the storm yeah, 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 yeah. would say something. Yep. Yeah, I trashed that one. That one I did trash. <laughs> well, there we go. Now, now we know he used it. But I, have, I think I still have. It's not in good shape, but I think I still have it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I I had I had the figures as well. Not you know didn't go in for the for the the vehicles either. It bothered me though. I you know I had a problem with them because around that time also like Mego Mego action figures were a big thing, right? And those yeah. were like seven or eight inch figures, and they were articulated. They were so great. The the wrist, the ankle. Oh yeah. The knees. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Star Wars ones. It was literally. The, it was just the, the shoulder joints and the hip joints, and that was it. And then the lightsaber was built in, and it, oh, I was always like, back then, I'm like, oh my god, like, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm. Uh-huh. <laughs> you're either yeah. sitting down or you're standing up, and that's uh-huh. all you're doing. Yeah. yeah. But for for me, it was the trading cards. I remember that because I had yes, because yep. the back then it was you know they had the the first edition I think was blue had a blue border, and that was back when you'd get the cards and then you turn them over and it would make like a puzzle of a scene. So oh, it, would like, yeah. it would be like 12, 12 different cards or nine cards, whatever it was. So you had to like try and collect so you could flip it over and you almost had you know you're missing one piece of it, and then it had the stickers. So for me, it was like like it was that type of stuff that was like more exciting because it was kind of. A little more tangible where I was collecting and 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 seeing what I was missing and and the excitement of getting the pack and you didn't know what was going to be in it and doubles and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, so yeah, the merchandise, Nick, you you said it. I mean, the how how, how is he going to how did there's no way he could have known. And there's no way the studio probably would have ever done that if they thought. Of course not. Right? Yeah. If they thought that this was going to be something that was going to be a merchandising behemoth, they would have no. never just given the rights away. Absolutely. Nobody, because, you know, nobody believed in him, not, not even his no colleagues, way. like, you know, people like, you know, Scorsese and De Palma and Coppola. They were all like, what are you what is this? What are you making? When he showed them, like, I guess, a rough yeah. copy, you know, they were yeah. all like, I don't understand this. What's going on here? But Spielberg, <laughs> I think, might have been the only yes, one. Yes, he claims to be the only one who liked it. Yeah. 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 And I think I the liked guy, it back Alan then. Ladd, <laughs> Alan Ladd Jr., who was the head of Fox at the time, believed in him, believed yeah. And whatever, because he knew it might be a hit. But other than that, nobody yeah. really. A lot of studios took a pass on it. Yeah. They, yeah. He kind of got a two picture deal. I think as early as 71, he was writing drafts. And they're like, oh, so I have this Star Wars thing and I have this American graffiti thing. And Universal's like, yeah, we'll, we'll take the American graffiti thing. You know, yeah, not sure his, about that. The sci fi thing yeah. was THX, right? I mean, THX. That was- very not I saw, dark, very at all. much, much yeah. more yeah. esoteric and, yeah. 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 It just yeah yeah little little out there. Not Star Wars. Not it's, Star Wars it's not at all. all. <laughs> no. Robert Duvall was probably like, "Damn, I picked the wrong sci-fi." <laughs> <thing to be laughs> it's like what? What was I in? Another was bit more, of merchandise yeah. I, was that I more had like a was student film? Th- yeah, that I think that was one of his first. Uh, it was a student film that he made. But then they, release, right? But then Coppola, uh, Zoetrope, American Zoetrope had it, and they they made a feature length film. Lost a ton of money, so that was the end of American Zoetrope at the time, I think. And yeah, that's when Lucas started Lucasfilm, you know, with, with American Graffiti. That was the yeah. first Lucasfilm production. So he essentially bankrupted American Zoetrope, <laughs> and he's and then, and then and in response, he he just forms his own production company. <laughs> and Coppola was still friends. No hard, no hard feelings. Yeah, I'm, right, I'm, exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna go give Martin Sheen a heart attack on Apocalypse Now. I'll see you in a, see you in a few years. <laughs> So it's funny. I, I did anybody re, did you rewatch anybody rewatch it recently for yes. the show or? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, 
it's funny because when I wa- when I rewatched it, uh, it, it hit me. And because when you're thinking about it critically, or you're thinking about it, and I, w- I was on this thing of you know, it's it's an action film or it's a sci fi film. Nothing really happens for the first twenty. Uh, it was almost like I don't know twenty twenty minutes before Luke Skywalker even shows up. Yeah, and yeah. you're still not even sure what the deal is with him. No, like it's very it's right. very for for a sci fi film that had this impact and this adventure story. Not a whole lot happens in the first 20 minutes. It's about C-3PO and R2-D2 kind of making their way across Tatooine yeah, you got droids, and getting you captured. Got, you got guys in white armor. Are they robots? Are they humans? Yeah. What You don't know what the, you know, this guy in black in a black mask and a cape. So for, a, for pay, yeah, yeah, from a, a woman with like standpoint. buns in her hair. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's yeah, like there's, there's an yeah. action scene in the beginning and then there's a long stretch where not a whole lot happens. And yeah. you don't really see but that nowadays in, in, in these types of films. It's like, let's get in, let's let's start the action. So you, you got to give him some credit for pacing this in a very interesting way. Yeah, he, where, he literally thrust you right into something. Like you didn't yeah. know what was happening. And like it, 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 you're you're in the middle of something that's been going on for you know quite some time here. I and mean, you're jumping right into the action of this thing. And it's just, yeah, it was really a brilliant way to introduce this world. You said it earlier, uh, Eric. It was you know, like he has a knack for world building, right? Yeah. Because at the very beginning, that first, his, you know, the shot that everybody talks about where you see that little freighter and then that giant cruiser, right, right there you see it's the small rebellion versus the empire, right? So yeah. it's like just visually he's telling you what's going on. You know it's, you know, good versus evil in terms of the lighting, you know, the, but even then yeah. it's like the subtext is going to grow in the future story, you know, the chapters, but yeah. everything you see when they land on the planet, it's all world building the Jawas. And, you know, you see that huge skeleton on the planet. So you, you're like, what kind of world is this? Is there any water yeah. on this planet at all? You know, um, it's amazing. Yeah. Fun, funny thing about the skeleton, the crate dragon that's there, mm-hmm. they left it there. <laughs> like they and, and now people go out like and some people found out where it was and they, they started digging it up and then you could buy like pieces of the crate dragon oh, wow. because That's they cut cool. a lot of stuff they just kind of left it there and let the sands take take it away yeah. and then people some people figured out they i guess found out like set sheets or whatever call lists or whatever found out where they were filming and and unearthed parts of it and they and they sell like pieces of that crate dragon now as, wow. as like you know, is that wild? It's that, that, that is, is wild. wild. Like they just left. They just left the sets. <laughs> it's like okay, you know, that's cool I, though. I mean, you know, yeah. that I, yeah, that's you know. Imagine like, walking well, in that... the desert and you trip over a bone, and it it turns out it was from a movie set, but it's like this dragon. Well, the homestead <laughs> is is a hotel. Huh. It, it always was. It was never. It, that wasn't a set. Like the 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 Lars homestead, like the in, like the down into the when you're in the pit area. That's a that's an actual hotel. Oh wow in Tunisia that they, that, that was, that existed there and they just used it to, you know, film the, you know, the, the, out, the upper portion of it was set, was a set like the igloo type, you know, structure. But, but yeah, that whole thing was, was a hotel. I mean, I don't know who would want to go <laughs> to a hotel in the middle of the desert, but it, it's, but it, but it was there, it existed. So that's, so, that's pretty the only cool. place you can get the blue milk. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I guess so. The locals but, say, Yep. <laughs> Talking about the pacing, you know, that that's really kind of what Sean, you said it, you know, like you see it as a kid for different reasons. Maybe you see it as a young adult for different reasons. And then if you look at it as an adult or, or a lover of film, you, you're, you can kind of appreciate it on a different level, like you said. And, yep. and I think that's yep. important. It, it, it was, it was abstract, right? It was more the, the, the way he told, you know, like the way he, you know, threw this stuff at you was, was very, it wasn't just like linear storytelling. It was just more or less, uh, you know, what is this? Like, like you said, do you like the first 20 minutes, you don't know what the hell's going on, but by, but by once Luke shows up and that's when the story really kicks in. And then you, then you're in your, that traditional journey where seamlessly the droids kind of blend into what he's doing and they just become his, his like, they work for him and then everything's normal at this point. And it's like a normal type of uh, narrative, but what do you guys think about like your when you think of Star Wars and like your impression of what what's the first thing you think of from this taken just from this film alone like what 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 is the most iconic thing that you think of when you when somebody says Star Wars I think of lightsabers okay I I mean those you know as a kid like 
oh god i want one of those you know like this the lightsaber and like you know and this the space battle i mean those i know you asked for one thing but those are the two things that i think of. lightsabers <laughs> and fighters yeah how about you nick it- <clears throat> The Force and the Jedi. I mean, I guess I, I was thinking lightsabers too, and I guess it's all tied in with the Force and the Jedi because it's this whole mythology. At first, you're seeing it's like science fiction, right? And mm-hmm. technology, and then suddenly you have this mystical element, and you know, hearing about the Force and who are the Jedi and what do you mean the dark side and what's what's going on. Um, but you know, the lightsaber itself is so iconic because that was the first I hadn't seen it anything like that and anything else I'd I'd, I'd seen before. So it's got that old medieval kind of sword and sorcery kind of thing. But now it's like the, you know, just, just amazing, the the fighting, the good versus evil and the power, right. Just like being able to, what, what can a Jedi do? And in later movies, you find out more that they can do, but the, you know, the Jedi mind trick, you know, so they can control what people think he's an old man. So what could he have done when he was younger? You know, because he's like, I'm getting too old for this. Yeah, so that was really – I just made me want to know more. And setting it in the fourth chapter, I guess, made made me think, like, what came before? You hear about the Clone Wars, and you yeah. hear about, you know, what what was it, you know? And, and that was – as a kid, your imagination started. And maybe that was what was the disappointment with the prequels because you had already kind of filled in the blanks a little bit, and it can never live up to your imagination. And yeah. looking at the no, prequels okay. now, I kind of like them a little bit more than, you know, at first. But, you know, there's still Well, I think flawed. if you put them up against the sequels, <laughs> right? You know, I, I, honestly, right. if you put them against the sequels, I think the prequels stand stand better. If you put it against the original trilogy, it might be a little different, I, I think, right? I like the sequels, yeah. too. I like the yeah. sequels, too. Uh, uh, that'll be another show. <laughs> well, what or, about maybe you, w- or maybe it won't. <laughs> what about you, Dean? What, what do you, what do you, what's the first thing you think of when you... <sighs> I, if are you looking for like imagery, like when I think of Star yeah, Wars, just what, what imagery quick, do like, I think? Yeah, exactly. <sighs> it's got to be Vader, okay. mm. you know, because because it was not not really a villain, so enigmatic, you know, and and it always struck me again when you say the, you know, and I'm going to keep saying it, you know, five minutes into the film, he killed somebody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is not again. It's I don't think this is. I'm not. I, I as as an 11 year old, I was not looking at it as children's entertainment. I was looking at it as this was a film with yeah. some stuff that was happening, and you know, and I got to. I'm kind of like, oh wow, I'm, I'm getting to watch this kind of. And look at this guy. He's dressed all in black, and he just snapped the neck of a dude, and then just throw him on the floor. I'm like, this is like serious business. Like the stakes were high, like right from the get go. So for me, if you're like one image, it's like Vader because. He came in in the beginning and made so, like you don't meet the hero or the heroes again. It's so strange. You get this this villain that gets all the oxygen in the first part of the film. Then we we he gets left behind <laughs> for a while mm-hmm. to to tell this other story. So it's very strange. So I, I would say Vader. What what about you, Eric? Tatooine. Tatooine. <clears throat> when I think of Star, when people say Star Wars, that is what the first thing I think of is the twin sons, the the desert. You know, you're used to seeing, like, I don't think, I hadn't seen movies like Lawrence of Arabia or, you know, those big epic films yet at that point in my life. So this was the first time I actually saw the desert as, as in this case, it's a, it's an alien world. And uh, wow. yeah, I mean, it's inextricably the, the, the most iconic thing that I think of when I think of Star Wars is that, that just that desert location and the vastness of it. And it's just, it was so... I was hypnotized the entire time. You know, when you get to the Death Star, it's really cool. But then you realize that's a set. You know, you realize mm-hmm. it's enclosed. You, you, okay, i kind of seen this before I, in other science fiction movies. I've seen this in like Logan's Run where they're running down the corridors and that kind of thing. Although this was something huge with all the matte paintings and everything made it look bigger than it actually was too. But I, don't, I can't think of many, many sci-fi films up to that point where they actually shot on location. Yeah, the in scope. An environment that was not, you know, right around the corner or, you know, or in a city or, you know what I mean? Yeah, or a yeah, sound such stage. An, ex- an exotic locale. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, that, that, that was, it'll always remain. Uh, even when, like in Phantom Menace, it's re- one of the reasons why I think I like Phantom Menace is because they went back there. Mm-hmm. And it really reminded me, took me back to that first time when I saw the, the, the first one for the first time. So I kind of, I, it was that nostalgic feel but it wasn't trying to be nostalgic in that way. Mm-hmm. It was just, 
that, you know, it's the same planet, you know, so it's, it, it worked for the story, but yeah, I just, yeah, that's, that's what I think of. So, yeah. So we talk about Luke Skywalker and he doesn't appear till like 20 minutes in the film. Mm-hmm. And then you get a second, but you get a second hero as well. And it's almost like the, the, the two, the, it's two heroes that are like the antithesis of each other. Right. Because you get Luke Skywalker, who represents like the absolute good and the purity of, you know, doing the right thing. And then lo and behold, they go into a bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they meet somebody who is not like that, but he he's a, a, as much a part of the story and represents, you know, a, a different type of, of hero. So let, let's kind of go around. Nick, are, is it Team Skywalker or is it Team Solo? I like them both. Like you said, they kind of balance no, 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 each other no, no, no. out. I... No, 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 no. Listen, you got to root for Han, right? Han, Han. If, there we if it was go. Just, if it was just Luke, he's this naive kid. You know, you needed Han to bring that kind of cynicism and, you know, the uh, the swashbuckling cowboy-esque kind of thing. But if you look at it from the whole saga, Luke becomes darker and Han becomes more, you know, he falls in love with Leia and he becomes, you know. Yeah, they both so change. So they, they, they change. But um, so for Han, Star Wars, Han, who is Han, it? It has to be Han in the in, in Star Because it's like he adds the humor to, you know, to it. Um, and he's the swashbuckling guy. You know, when I was a kid, I looked up to both of them, you know. But Luke was a kid. You know, he's, I mean, what was he supposed to be in this? A teenager? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to visualize yeah, late what, what teens is, you yeah know, i think he's like 20. 20 so you just yeah. realize he was he was a kid you know um and back then you know in hollywood movies you needed that kind of demographic that han solo represented you know he was the hero he was the guy yeah. that would go in there and shoot first you know <laughs> um so, <laughs> here we go but um my clunky yeah sean skywalker uh, or solo uh, I'm solo. I, I I definitely I don't know if I was at the time. I probably was. I started to gravitate towards him. Um, I didn't think this at the time, but now I look back at Luke. He's a little whiny. A little. Uh, a little, oh, yeah. little, little whiner. <laughs> like like I'm like shut. Like I'm like God, yeah. stop. Like you're whining. <laughs> like I I didn't think it at the time, but like I said, you 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 reach. You know, you go through your progression of huh? Star Wars. And, you know, Han's cooler with the gun, you know, with the blaster and Luke's kind of like, he's kind of like, you know, indicating when he shoots, like it's, <laughs> I, I, I'm all about team. I, Han's cool. He's just so cool and suave. And I, if I wanted to be one of them, I'd want to be Han. You know, that's, right. uh, so that's two, two for solo, Eric. Solo for sure. Solo yeah. for sure. Three Harrison for solo. Ford. Harrison Ford was my man crush I mean, for years. He was my hero and there's no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. Everything from from to Han Solo to Indy, Indy. To Deckard from Blade Runner. Oh my God! You know, uh, you know, uh, Doctor Richard Kimball, Richard Kimball, Jack Ryan. I mean, yeah, yeah. But Solo is my kind of hero. Okay, I, I never, I don't believe in the perfect hero. Never have. I mean, I, 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 I the White Knight kind of thing. I, I just never. Luke to me was what really sold me on Luke was his innocence. And that, you know, that whininess and that, and that naivete he has is, is to me is what makes the character. It has nothing to do with him becoming a Jedi Knight necessarily, yeah. you know, uh, but Solo, like he's the guy that, yeah, he only cares, you know, he's like Rick Blaine from Casablanca almost like he's got that cynicism, but he's just kind of, I don't care about anybody but me, you know, but then he, at the end, he, you know, of course he turns around and he, and he, and he saves the, literally saves the day Luke, you know, yeah, if he yeah. didn't show up, yep. if he, if he hadn't shown up, Luke would have been dead. Right. I mean, that's, that's true. You know, and how many yeah. times did that happen in throughout the trilogy, by the way, where Luke always needed to be bailed out of something, even, even, even in return of the Jedi, it's like, he, he's on the ground. He's, you know, he's, he's not fighting the emperor with a lightsaber and he's not using the force and, you know, he's, he's almost Good dead. Point. He's re, he's relying on the compassion that he has for his father, yeah. you know, that his father will turn and, 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 and save him, you know? So there's, it's, there's something bigger going on there than, uh, than just him becoming a Jedi. And I think that really carries over to last Jedi, by the way, yeah. absolutely. where people like that. hated the way they depicted him, but I think it makes perfect sense. Yeah, but I agree. That's a discussion right. for another time. I, I'm going to, I'm going to complete yeah. the, the, the four of a kind and go with uh, Han Solo from the beginning. He was just the coolest. Yeah. I, oh yeah. He, he had the swagger. 
Come on, he's got the he's got that that blaster slung so low on his hip, so low. Get it? So, <laughs> so low on his hip. See what you did there. He's got that. Just the epitome of cool. Nick made a good point, and Eric made a good point. Actually, Sean made the point. He's just like Luke was so wimpy, right? Hmm. But by the time you get to Jedi, that his pure good is actually what closes out the story, right? Is yeah. that he is he is such a believer in the pure good. Yeah. That he is able to turn his father. So in the first film in Star Wars, it's kind of like, yeah, he's, he's a farm boy. He's just really pure of heart. And, you know, and it's kind of like, yeah, OK, that that only kind of increases or only doubles and triples down on it as the films go on, believing mm -hmm. that is what is going to be enough to change to, to redeem his father. So it's kind of interesting where he starts out that way. And it's kind of like, yeah, I, I was never a Skywalker fan either. I mean, he's great, yeah. you know, but uh, it was always about Han. Huh. Let me ask you guys this. Um, um, getting back, you know, I guess com com coming back to that point, do you feel in any in any way that Luke was manipulated into becoming into going on this journey? Do you By kind of feel like Obi Wan was kind of like kind of guilting him into doing this in a sense? Like, do you do you, do you kind of get that? I, I know I, I kind of get that when I watch it now. Like he's because he's kind of like he's sitting there. He's like, "Oh, you must do what you feel is right, of course." And he's like looking away. He's not looking at him. He's and then you know later on in like Jedi, he's kind of like, "No, I can't kill my father." And they're, and both Yoda and Obi Wan are telling him, "You need to kill your father in order to become a Jedi Knight." Is that the right thing? <laughs> Which is not the right thing. Um, and Luke is like, "No, I can't do it." He's like, "Well, then the Emperor's already won, you know. Just, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, you know yeah. everything. All hope is lost. You just, you know." So, uh, Hold yeah, up the I, mean, again. I, I just kind of get that. You know, was it really Luke's destiny to become a Jedi? I wonder. You know, and I again, I or, think. Or, Ryan, or are you saying, or was Obi Wan just waiting for the right time well, to like spring it on him? Yeah, I, I and, guess. But you know, all the lies and all the like, this whole like. Did he really tell Luke the complete truth of what really went down? I mean, Luke from is a himself, certain point of view. <laughs> Luke is pretty much always heard that, everything right? from I mean, a he, certain yeah. point when of he, view. When he made the prequels, he pretty much yeah. said the Jedi failed. This yeah. was the story of the the failure of the Jedi right. and how, in my in my mind, they're they're solely responsible for Anakin turning to the dark side. It has nothing to do with yeah. with Palpatine. He's just waiting in the wings, waiting for it to happen. Yeah. You know, let the yeah, Jedi that's... do the dirty work because they, you know, they didn't trust them. They didn't because they were sticking to their old ways. And and so, yeah, I, I, to me, to hold that whole arc, that whole journey of Luke just makes perfect sense that he would be at that point in time that he would be so like afraid and, and so broken that, you know, because he learned the truth, I guess, over the over the years. Like, you mm -hmm. know, and he, he was the latest example of that failure instead of doing something new. You know, he should have he should have taken a different path and in, in, in training a new generation of Jedi. He should have said, you know, like, I, I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to show you there's there's something bigger with the force here than just the Jedi and the Sith. I think that's what Ryan Johnson, I think it's trying to say in Last Jedi. But unfortunately, Abrams didn't agree. <laughs> he went to, he, yeah. he they just, totally they you know, took, took it, it somewhere else. But uh so, Sean, you were talking. You said you had the Miko Star Wars, the disco you, trap. Yeah. I, did you did you have did you did you have the score as well? I do, I I shouldn't say I, I had it. My this is eight track time. I remember yeah. it, it was on an eight track. So like I remember they would play it for me in the car, and it was like din -din -din, and I hear the blasters and the the Jawas were in it. It's just like and the Cantina band kicked in. It was like funky beat. Like yeah, I I. I, I remember it, but I don't, I don't, I don't remember the packaging or I just remember it being played for me in the car. Probably keep me quiet. Um, you know. <laughs> Eric, Eric you, had, you had the vinyl, right? You had the score? The score? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. On vinyl? I did. And uh, uh, Sean, you mentioned before, like that last piece of music, you know, the throne room. I, I remember distinctively having my headphones on at the time and listening to the, and I didn't realize that I was singing along with the music and I, I guess I was singing so loud that my 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 mom came in and she's like you're so loud what are you doing because I was like dun, 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 dun. you know yeah. uh, so that you know I just remember but that was a great great score album because it it felt like you could sit down and listen to it and 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 detach yourself from the film 
and you were still getting the film with the music. You just listen to that whole thing yeah. from beginning to end. And it was one of those scores where you don't really need to see the film to, to really experience the, the thrill of that, of that score, of that music. That I think I did. Made. It was an, it opened you know? up, right? It's yeah. in Star Wars on it in black. Yep. And then when you opened it, I yeah. did yeah. have it. We had it. Absolutely. We had Nick, it. Nick, Nick, the score you had it. I did not have it, but I love the score. I mean, John Williams is amazing and all. Yeah. yeah. The fact that, you know, there's the Luke Skywalker theme. And then in the later, later movies, you had a, you know, a theme for the emperor and the, em- you know, it's just the Imperial March. Vader's right? theme. Yeah. So it yeah. just, yeah. it felt like you said, you could listen to it and kind of feel the epic scope of the story without seeing the yeah. movie, but then combined with the visuals in the movie, it just adds to it, you know, right from that oh, first sure. chord when and, the movie and I, first starts, right? Yeah, and I think that's very important too. I, I think the fact that the score was a serious piece of music and it wasn't like a schlocky interpretation of sci-fi music, that it wasn't trying to be maybe, uh, you know, timely with, with the, you know, the 70s, that put it, because, when you know, when I was watching the film, I'm like, oh my god! Like the score is so present in the film. Like the yeah. the the different themes are so like upfront and present in the film. Especially like the Tie Fighter attack at the end. You know when Han and Luke are are, are you know they're, they're they escape the Death Star. The music is just so in front of you and so so there, and it became so recognizable. I remember. I, I don't know how old I was. It was at one of my cousin's like birthday parties around the time it came out. And he got like the the set the score the soundtrack on vinyl for a birthday gift. I mean that's how like in depth in deep it got like into the into the public yeah. consciousness that kids were getting the the soundtrack as gifts. So yeah. it, it transcended like the toy. It's like oh here's here's the score. Like li- go listen to the score of this film, you ten year old. You know, and and they, what I mean, and that's yeah. I, I remember sitting in like the library and and putting the score on and listening to it and. The yeah. first side, the last song would be Cantina Band, and and you'd know that you were, you know, so it, it it I think it opened up a lot of different avenues to, you know, film, then music for film, and 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 how iconic that could be, or how you can separate it and enjoy it, and and kind of be exposed to it in, in a different way, and and sit there and just listen to it, which a yeah. lot of people were doing. So it's. It, it broke so much ground on so many different I, levels. I remember getting it that year for Christmas, that same See? year the film came, came out. And I knew that I had gotten it for Christmas before Christmas day, you know, cause I, I was, I saw my mom buying it in the store <laughs> and I saw, you know, she's walking out of the record store and, you know, she's got it in the bag and she brought it home. And then like I, this one night, uh, you know, she, I, I snuck into the, you know, my bedroom was across you know, the living room, you had to go across the living room to get to the dining room where she would wrap all the presents and, you know, everything was in the closet in there. So I remember like sneaking into the dining room one morning, this is like a couple of days before Christmas. And cause I, cause I knew she had, I, cause I just wanted to see it. I wanted to hold it. <laughs> I had, you know, I had to have it, you know, and my mom, I didn't realize that my mom was like lying on the couch sleeping <laughs> And on my way back, I could see one of her eyes open, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, nothing. she goes, I'm, do, do, you know, you got that album. I'm bringing it back. You know, you're not getting it. Oh. I was like, <laughs> and I was threats. so like, and yeah, she purposely like hit it like that. She purposely gave me that present last Thinking, and the whole time I was thinking that she actually brought it back to the store because I, I, could, I couldn't find it under the tree. I was like looking for it. I'm like, oh, she stuck you know, it to you. Yeah, she, she stuck, stuck it to you. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so so. We, we talked about Team Solo or Team Skywalker. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean it's your favorite character. Do you, Nick, do you have a favorite character in the film? If it's one of those, but do you have a favorite character? I mean, they're, they're also great. Princess Leia was, you know, heroic unlike she wasn't just this like damsel in distress right she yeah. jumped but obi-wan was you know ben was the character for me because he was the jedi knight and he was the one that kind of brought in that backstory you know when they asked about his father and you see his eyes kind of you know in hindsight you're like okay he's totally lying he knows it's darth vader but at the <laughs> moment you're like what what is he hiding yeah. what's going on you know something yeah, was that up. weird pause yeah and he just, you know, to Eric's point about, you know, if, if this was just a standalone movie, 
it's not so innocent. Yeah. The the Jedi aren't that innocent, you know. So like what happened during the Clone Wars and the kids' imagination in me was just kind of like, what are clones? Is is Ben a clone? You know, is Obi Wan yeah. Kenobi? Is that a clone name or what is that? So <laughs> yeah. No I idea. Just, I, 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 I love I love Ben and I just love you know and Alec Guinness in the role was just he he brought some gravitas to it and you know some legitimacy. Here's this like person who was like in so many great classic films and he's you know yeah. Yeah. playing he, this he, he had his doubts at the time there are letters that he wrote like this guy lucas or he didn't even know his name he's yeah, like i'm he, not sure he knows what he's doing or, or you know i mean it was a job a for fan, him right it was a job for him and and you know it paid off sean he was so, pro- he was so professional apparently yeah was, was, yeah he yeah, was he's so. getting he's a paid actor so and he so delivers he, some of those lines like you know Moss Eisley Spaceport. You know, <laughs> never has there been a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be if casting him and, and <laughs> Peter Cushing was a stroke yeah. of genius on yeah, Lucas's part. For sure. You for know, sure. both of those veteran actors really sort of anchored the, the legitimacy of this film in a sense. Yeah. You know, so yeah. It's yeah. probably all they could afford. <laughs> and they can only afford James Earl Jones's voice. They couldn't even afford to employ him fully. They go, like, well, we want, you know, we'll get James Earl Jones, but only yeah. his voice. Sean, and Sean David Pratt thought he was doing the dialogue. Yeah, he thought he, he was thought doing it. Was it. In the movie. <laughs> favorite favorite character? What do you got? I'm go with Wedge. Wedge and nah, Tilly's. Nah, I'm kidding. I love Wedge. <laughs> I lo- I love Wedge though. He's in all three. I think he's in the the, the sequels. But um, my yeah. favorite. Probably at the time when I saw it, it was probably it was probably it probably was Darth Vader because I got to meet him in person. Uh, but now it's 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 Han that is my favorite character. I love him. I think Consistent he's cool. The, the the king of cool. Yeah. And then now, now here's the thing about that. It, there's a weird at the end. I think some. I think you're talking about. Oh, Han, Han Solo is redeemed. Mm-hmm. At the very end, when they all after the after the Death Star is blown up and they they're all like in the hangar. And uh, he says, oh, he says to Luke, oh, oh, I wasn't going to let you collect all that reward or something, right? (laughs) And then she says, I knew there was more to you than money. No, there's not. He just said he only cared about was the reward. What do you mean you knew that there was more to him than money? He just just blatantly said he came back because I'm not going to let you collect all that. I knew there was more to you than money. Well, then they weren't listening to me. (laughs) (laughs) Eric, favorite character? that uh, It could be any of the other ones, Solo or, or Skywalker. I yeah I mean solo uh, of course so of course him and I love the the chemistry between him and Chewie you know Chewbacca was always a cool absolutely mm-hmm. cool like creation you know but I think I I don't know I I, I guess I, I yeah I could say he's my favorite but I just like the ensemble I like the mm-hmm. whole bit and the way they played off each other and they were just so perfectly everybody had their specific role to play in this thing you know, and it was so like, so a part of that mythology that it was just, you know, so really cool. But yeah, I guess Solo would be. Solo? Right. Of course. I'm, I'm yeah. going to go with, and he's been my favorite since since day one, is the Wookiee Chewbacca. <laughs> oh, you know, you got to you gotta watch, you have to watch him. You actually have to watch him act. Because it's so easy to, to whenever Chewbacca's yeah. in a scene, it's usually Han Solo or someone else, and there's usually dialogue. And Chewbacca doesn't really talk in any any way that you were going to understand. So you got to watch, especially. I would ask everybody watch the 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 this first scene in the cantina when they're negotiating with with Obi Wan and 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 Luke Skywalker, and Han Solo is doing all the talking. So normally you're going to be watching Han Solo because you're captivated by Harrison Ford. Yeah, but you got to watch Chewbacca because his eyes are just kind of like moving back and forth. He's kind of Han Solo's listening. He's kind of like looking over towards him and then looking and the mouth opening a little bit. Like he's, he's, he's involved in the scene. He's not just like they put him in the, in the, in the costume and said, sit there. You're right. And it's a hard thing right. to do, yeah. like to be present in, no doubt. in, in a lot of those scenes. So I really love, I love watching Chewbacca. I just love watching him yeah, in these scenes. There's a lot going on. And yeah. Cause he's just kind of there. He's, he's yeah. there. He takes it all in. He's not able to really communicate, and when they do, it, it, he's usually you know yelling about something, or everything he says sounds like a yeah. yell anyway. Um, so he's he was just always my favorite Chewbacca. It's well, that, just that like one, you know, that, well, the one scene where like Obi Wan takes out the guy, right, and Chewbacca's just standing there, like you can almost swear he's just smiling. He's, yeah. just, he's yeah. so easily it. amused. He's like, yeah, this guy's Dean, well. Dean yeah. do you have a Chewbacca yeah. impression for us or no? <laughs> All right. <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm glad he done. finally got his medal at the you know the end of the yeah. saga. 
So he, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he got he got done dirty. Uh, you know, if you're if you're taller than Leia, you can't get a medal. If even if you're standing on like even if you're standing on lower steps and you're still taller than her, you don't get a medal, I guess, because you can't reach that. No. but yeah, it was. You know, it, it's that's the thing about this film is there's just so much there. There's so many different you know different pieces. Now, now, Nick, you sent an email earlier in the week when we were kind of going back and forth, and you yes. linked to you linked to a, a an article. And if you could just go into that a little bit more, because I think it was very interesting. You talked about about Star Wars. You talked about Star Wars and and circles. Yeah, I wrote I wrote this years ago on my blog. It's it's my circle theory. I had been watching Star Wars since I was a kid, and then when I was in school, I had to do a paper on it. And I said I noticed the motif of the circle repeated a lot, especially at the very beginning. And I just felt that um, I was surprised how often it was there. And then that final line when Vader is, you know, he's like, the circle is now complete. So it made me think about that, like, nonlinear, circular kind of storytelling. And Lucas, this was the movie he wanted to make for years and years and years. He had this in his head. I can't imagine that the repeated circle theme um, was a mistake or just accidental. Um, So I don't know the full intent of what he was trying to go for. But for me, as I was reading it, I just felt like it was that circular storytelling, the narrative flow. And if you look at the you know the uh, the Campbell mythology that inspired yeah. him to do this kind of storytelling. Um, Campbell talks about the circle and and that circular heroic journey. You know, um, yeah. the discovery and then the return. Right, the hero always returns in the end. So it made me wonder why did he start his saga in the middle? Why did he start with Episode Four, like jumping right into it? And maybe it was just you know a haphazard decision on his part. But I still think that he really had this kind of circular theme in his, in mind. And even if this was going to be the one time he, he did Star Wars, he wasn't going to do any sequels afterwards. He didn't know if it was going to be a hit or not. I mm-hmm. think he kind of really played up that circle, but everything from, you know, the planets and the, the portals and, you know, so you see spheres and hemispheres and, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I just think it's intentional. Uh, yeah. 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 I, um, I read that, article and uh, i thought it was great and when i watched the movie in prep for this it, there's a circle in literally every shot in the film you go you go watch yep. it and you'll see everything a circle of somewhere yep. in the shot twin suns it, yep. <laughs> sometimes the, there's a bunch the sometimes panel. it's really small very subtle even yeah. on the sand crawler on the treads of the yeah. sand crawler you Everyone. see circles you see yeah they're Something all over so, yeah, yeah and, that was, and, that was and brilliant. Talked about the the hero's journey in Joseph Campbell, which is very this is very much inspired by too. I, I think we'll grab the for the show notes. I think we'll grab the Wikipedia article about Joseph Campbell and the mm-hmm. and the myth of the hero's journey. I think it'll be a nice companion piece. All right, let's talk about special editions. <laughs> <laughs> no Yay. one has ever. No Can't one wait. has ever. I, maybe Ridley Scott. I don't even think Ridley Scott has gone this far with with tweaking a film retweaking a film, tweaking it again, retweaking it. And and George Lucas actually said something a, a long time ago about filmmaking, which I had always carried with me when I started to dabble in it. And but but he's not taking his own advice because he said he goes, uh, films are never finished. They're mm. only they're abandoned. Right. Meaning you, if you, you have to stop at some point, like because you, if you just keep doing it, you're, you, you're never going to finish. You have to abandon it, literally saying, OK, this is it. It's done. And yeah. I, I, you know, with the advent of new technology in the 90s and, and cutting edge and, and all that thing that, you know, the, the first special editions was really just a cleanup. It was like, you know what, we can clean up some of these effects you see some boxes over the, you know, over the X wings or the Tie Fighters when they're when they're flying, you know. So, so the first swing at a special edition was really just kind of cleaning it up a little bit. And did anybody have a problem with with that aspect of it? Of just, yeah, we we can make the effects look better because that was the first pass at it. I I remember I was excited to see the the not only to see it on the big screen, but just to be able to see something new come out of it you know so of course we were all excited about the technology at the time with jurassic park and you know all this stuff but yeah and then you know and then <laughs> and then, and then java came on the screen and i was like Ugh, you know and, and you know greedo shot first and i don't know what the hell he was thinking there <laughs> i really 
it's not, it doesn't look good. It's, it's just, it, it's the effects were not great. And I think the editing, you know, just the way it was like put into the film, it was awkward looking. It, it wasn't even edited right. It just, it looks, it, it stood right out and it just, I thought it was horrible. You know, I, I will, I, on the other, on the, on the other side of it, you said, you mentioned the cleaning up of the film itself was probably the best thing that they did because it looked great, you know, pristine and, you know, all the, you know, they got, you know, it, it wasn't as grainy. It wasn't, you know, whatever, but yeah, but those real, those like standout shots uh, with the droid, you know, and the Jawa hanging off the thing. And none of it was necessary. I, I just, <laughs> no, I, I, I thought so, it was all horrible. Yeah. Sean, do, do you think yeah. stuff like that in, for you, does it enhance it? Does it make it more geeky or does it, is it yeah. just, add, is it adding to something that didn't, are, are you adding, are you adding to, toppings to a pizza that already has every topping on it? It's tough because there are things he wanted to do that he couldn't do because I guess of money and time and would he have done them as well then as he did when he was able to do it later on in revisiting? Uh, probably not. But I, what I don't like, and I, and I don't mind it, and I, I agree with Eric, some of it's a little out of place and unnecessary, but I, I don't like now that... I'm losing the memory of what the original film was because I can't yes. get my hands on an original version of the film. So when I rewatch this, I'm like Disney plus, And I'm like, all right, this is going to be up. Yeah, it's a special edition. Like they yeah. don't have like, like, like the original cut. It's that's all you get. That's all you're getting. Mm -hmm. Unless you could dig out a VHS tape or you happen to have a DVD somehow that had a special edition. So I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me, but, uh, to the, to that point, but I I would like to be able to see the film I originally saw when I was a kid, and I don't and I feel yeah. like it's difficult to do. Yeah. Nick, do you do you think that that the director should should have that ultimate ultimate control of saying the original print a, a, that you saw that made all this money that had such an impact it changed it changed the face of filmmaking. Do you think a director, you know, obviously it's their piece of work, but do you think it's it, it transcends that and belongs now to the public and that they, he can say, well, yeah, you're never going to, it's not like they, the, the film was pulled and never going to be shown again. It's not like, Oh, we made this film and you know, we're never going to show it and we're going to pull it. It's still being shown. So why not? Like Sean says, wh why not have just the original one available as well? I'm on your side with that. I think, I mean, it's their intellectual property. Lucas can do whatever he wants with it. And now Disney can do whatever they want with it. Um, I didn't mind seeing the cleaned up version. I didn't mind seeing deleted scenes. I remember having a storybook of Star Wars and they had a, a, a picture of Biggs with Luke in the sand. Mm. I'm like, that's not in the movie. Yeah. Where did that come from? <laughs> right? I, I know and then you yeah. read the novel, you yeah. know, and it's like, so I don't mind including that, you know, things like that. But um, I, as a Star Trek fan, they did the same thing with Star Trek. They would, they redid some of the special effects. And I like that. I loved seeing the pristine. I loved what they did. You know, that. I thought that was great. And yeah. I kind of don't want to go back to the older versions because I like it nice and clean and pristine. And having yeah. seen Star Wars over the years only on TV, when I went for the special editions and I saw it on the big screen and I saw Moss Eisley and how that looked, the way he had that, I didn't mind that at all. But then when you start at you know the end of Return of the Jedi, when you see the the, the Force ghosts. Yep. And it's not the older Anakin, it's the younger Anakin. I'm like, why? Like, I didn't understand yeah, those yeah. choices. I didn't understand, yeah. you know, Greedo shooting first. I, I didn't understand that. I was like, why change the story? I can understand tweaking it and then make it the, make the original available. You know, eventually yeah, it will yeah. be. Eventually it's going to be public yeah. domain I, I, after I, I'm I, dead, you know, but yeah, somebody it, will see it. Why can't I we so. who grew up with it see it? You know, we should somebody be. Can, that, can the thing that baffles it. me is that if, with every release – Every like, okay, it came out on VHS, the special, the special editions, you had what you saw in the theater and then it came out on DVD. So they changed some things. They changed Jabba. They made him look better. Uh, and it, with every major release, everything like Blu-ray and then now 4K, there's always some tweaking. They're constantly tampering with this film. And that's what I can't stand. It's like, I don't even remember. Right. To Sean's point, what the original film looked like, if or even sounded like, for this for that matter, because I remember seeing the special edition in the theater for the first time, and I remember like the, the you know the stormtroopers coming through like the chasm when they're about to swing across, and I could swear I heard Dirty Harry's like 
44 Magnum, like they changed the sound effects, right? But what the hell was that? I heard, you know, that classic, you know, Magnum sound. I'm like, where did that come from? Who put that in there? Like, <laughs> yeah. what, what, and why? You know, and then and since then they've cleaned that up and changed it. But they're, like I said, they, they just constantly changing the sound mix. And, and I don't even remember what the original film even sounds like anymore. Or I, I, it's for the life of me. It's just, there's been so many different, different tamperings. And I, I just, I hate, I hate the idea of that. It's like, what, there's no reason for it. Well, Leave yeah, it alone. That, that's my, that was the point I was getting to is, you know, when you watch the special editions, all the things that are done are really like, like, like peripheral things. Like a do a do back in 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 the back parked in the cantina and these weird animals walking in front of the screen yeah. in in Moss in Moss Eisley, and I'm like this isn't this isn't adding anything to the story. So why would you put you know right. if there was a scene that was like oh this is you know this changes the whole tenor of it. This is where they talk about Luke's father and let's put this in because now we have all these other stories, but yeah. it's just like weird weird quirky things little little robots walking around i'm like well what is this you know is this what you had in mind or are you doing it because you can you know and I that's think the it, thing i think is, it's the latter I, yeah, I most certainly it, think it's the latter because yeah. and that's the, the was the beauty of star wars is you know the the classic you know the the saying that you know necessity is the mother of invention meaning he only had an 11 million dollar budget and was not George Lucas. So he had to figure out a way to do things and, and economize and whittle down ideas. Then yeah. once you've got the keys to the kingdom, you don't yeah. really have to think that much about, is this a good idea? Is this character good? It's more, you can kind of fulfill your whims. And I think that's what it was because yeah, the, the famous thing is, is what changes the thing that changes this film the most is, is Greedo. Yeah. Wholesale. I mean, it wholesale, it wholesale changes Han Solo's character. It makes him, Right. More sympathy. He, he, he went from like a cold blooded killer who was going to, you know, do what he needed to do to a guy that's just kind of, now he's like a lovable rogue. Right. It's not, you know, even, it's not, you know. and that's the thing. It's not even a question of him being a cold blooded killer. It's just a simple matter of it's either him or me. Yeah. You're in that right. situation. This guy's going to kill me. He's a bad It's not going to be me. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know. Yeah. What that, was the problem with that? Why was that a problem? I, I, Luke is like, oh, Han, we don't want to convey that Han Solo is a bad guy. I don't think he's being he's It's self-preservation. Yeah. And with that, <laughs> yeah. you know, the storytelling wise, it was so perfect to have him shoot first because it, it, it's the Wild West is like that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. So you don't know at the end of the movie if he's coming back. You, you assume he's gone. So when That's he does right. show up, you're like, wow, this guy you're exactly is right. Back. Yeah. And he's it's not just back. for the money. You know, you, you, know, you know, the subtext is he came back because it was the right yeah. thing to do. Um, yeah. But and it it wasn't even a good special effect. Like it's you you can't tell who shot first with that. The, you know, it's like it's just oh, it clumsy. Was, it was horrible, and, and, and it's just like it didn't need it to be lucky, done. You know, it didn't a really need to be bad done. edit. I mean, and then and since then they've tried to make it. I think at first it was Greedo. You had that little pencil thin laser that just it looked out of place, and it just and you could see the screen like literally jump. Mm -hmm. in that edit and it's just horrible didn't yeah. need to since be then they've tried to they've tried to make it better by having them fire at the same time there's like i think it's the blu-ray edition yeah. where they're they're actually they timed it better so they kind of fixed it there yeah but now you have this god-awful mcclunky thing what is that <laughs> about like what, what i don't know I, and i never yeah. as I, a I, kid you know, I, as a kid i never <laughs> thought Wow, he's a murderer! Look, he just yeah. killed Greedo. I was like, no. Greedo, no. Greedo was going to bring him dead or alive. Yeah, he was kill you know, him. he was like, that's right. Him. So I was like, I, I that's, think that's I how think... you get out of this place. I didn't think that Ben was evil because he was, you know, he cut the guy's arm off. Yeah. You know, it's like, right? It's, we're, we're, this is we're the seeing, wild we're west. Used this to that to violence. Yeah, you, this you, is you, the wild west. It really, yeah. yeah, it's it's a lawless time. It, there's dangerous people around. That's Solo, it. yes, he's in a dangerous business. You know, he's a smuggler, so of course he's going to be, yeah. I, and, I think that course, I think sorry, that Greedo, yeah. I think that Greedo must have been a stormtrooper because that <laughs> yeah, shot wasn't even. Terrible. I mean, he he had him point blank, and that he's holding the gun straight, and the and the, the blazer blast goes off to them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it like takes like a forty five degree <laughs> angle turn, and then and then what's really baffling is that they inserted the scene with Jabba. He yeah. finally got to do that, but the whole reason the scene with Greedo even exists at this point is because he couldn't do that scene with Jabba. Because yeah. mm -hmm. if you notice a lot of the dialogue in that scene is redundant. It's like, he says the exact same thing that, that the conversation with Greedo has, like, you know, 
I got boarded sometimes. I had to dump my shipment, you know, you know, Java, Java ends up saying all the same stuff and he's telling Java all the same stuff. So it's, it, it didn't, the scene didn't need to even be there in the first place. Yeah. It was great to see an extra scene with Han Solo and Chewie, but that, I mean, the God awful thing of him stepping on his tail and you could, and again, that it jump in fake. the screen where it it's like fake. that cut, it looks yeah. so fake. I think the first time you saw him, I think our, our friend Andy, you know, I talked when the first time I, I met him, we were talking about the special editions. And he's like, yeah, Jabba looked like a sad worm in that, in that, ver- in that very first special edition. Like he just didn't yeah. even look like, you know, but at least yeah. they fixed him a little bit. So he resembles the version yeah. that you see in Phantom Menace, but you know, yeah. uh, but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, it is, it, <laughs> we're, we're stuck only, with only, it. We're I'd stuck say with the it. only, the only things that actually make sense are the inserting the emperor the actor in Empire, like putting yeah. Ian McDarmon in, that was that made sense, and then, and I think changing Boba Fett's voice, I thought was yeah. was right yeah. to tomorrow, you know Morrison, but whatever. Anyway, uh, yeah, again, incidental stuff. So, um, all right, as as we wrap this up, let's let's go with, let's go once around with we've done we've done Team Han or T, or Team Skywalker. What scenes get the get the get the hair on your arms or the back of your neck. What scenes really do that for you and, and kind of get you going? Nick, why, why don't you start us off? This is going to be a controversial cho- choice, I guess, because so many people now criticize it, but I think it's the lightsaber duel between Darth Vader and, and Ben. It's not dramatic. It's not, you know, acrobatic, like, you know, Darth Maul or some of the later, you know, e- even Luke versus Darth Vader. But I loved it. I thought when I first saw that, I was like, these lightsabers in battle, right? And the fact that they were going so slow, I knew Ben is old and I, he, he was doing it to kill some time so that they could escape. The Millennium Falcon can take off, right? So I could buy into it, you know? And to me, it was just, it was amazing seeing the master versus the pupil and, you know, the circle is now complete, right? So, and then when he got killed, Watching that, I was like, "He's dead." It was that same shock that Luke had. Like, wait a second, you know, here's this great character, and he's he's gone. And yeah. you know, Vader stepping on his, you know, on his robe. He's like, "Where'd he go?" <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then you hear the voice, you know, so you know, okay, Jedi Knights live on. There's something beyond. There's you know, this. So the mythology was there to kind of built that up. So I, I love that scene. I, I to this oh. day, I I'm glad they didn't change that in the special editions and make them do backflips and do all that stuff. You know, speed, they sped like, it, they doubled, like, they sped like, it up to two times like, speed, like Dooku, like <laughs> flipping over the railing exactly. and, and, and exactly. attacking the clones. I'm like, uh. and with his with his fencing flourish, Eric, yeah. favorite scene that that kind of gets gets the hairs on the on the oh my favorite scene in the back of your neck because you're bald. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> No, he's right. It's it's the, whatever hairs I do have in the back right here. So, but uh, for me, hands down, it's the it's the entire battle of Yavin, the the last, you know, the the ex of the Death Star battle. I mean, it's especially the end. You know, when you got how many pilots got killed? They're all gone, but Luke, and then you know, Wedge couldn't stay with them, and then Biggs gets killed, and then you, and he's literally the last one left, and then you know that was the we were all on the edge of of our seats, you know, at, at that moment. And it was so tense and so great. And then of course, Han comes in and saves the day. And uh, yeah, that, that's all my all time favorite. I could still watch that scene and just, you know, uh, gush over it and geek out over it. Yeah. Cool. So great. Sean? Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm with Eric. That scene is just, I, I'm, I'm right. I'm, I'm four years old again in the theater and I, I am like on the edge of my seat and I'm like, is he going to do it? And yeah, you know, like they're just getting picked. And when Han comes in and, you know, hits the other fighter into Darth Vader's and he spins out and, yeah. and then he gets the, you know, use the four, you know, Ben tells him to use the four as he like takes away the, you know, the, uh, the guidance system. And yeah. Yeah. And, Luke, you've turned off your targeting computer. Yeah, What's wrong? It's just amazing, you know, amazing. And you see him fly away and there's the death star, like, you yep. know, and, Nice. It's, it gets me every time. Nice. Yep. My, my, you guys all picked stuff towards the end of the film. Mine is my favorite. One of my favorite scenes is towards like the middle of the film when, when the Millennium Falcon is just getting ready to leave Moss Eisley, and all of a sudden a line of stormtroopers just like show up, 
Like they're kind of, you know, kind of wiping off the wiping off the Millennium Falcon, you know, polishing it. And all of a sudden all these stormtroopers show up and, and they just start firing. And Han Solo just like starts like like starts picking them off. And he runs up the ramp. He's like, Chewie, get us out of here. And they just and that's like the movie kind of like starts. Mm. Yeah. Right. Because they they're getting out of Tatooine. They're getting into space. They're all together. It's kind of like the, you know, the adventure it now begins because you've got like the core team all together, you know, whether they want to be or not kind of with, you know, they're on their way to Alderaan, but they don't know what's, what's going to be happening there. But for me, that, that always kind of got me I, that the scene of just all the stormtroopers all of a sudden showing up, <laughs> it's like, Oh crap. Yeah. And then he's just kind of, kind of trying to get a couple of shots off to buy some time. And the so look on, the ramp on, and, and on get Solo's out. face when he's like, yeah. when, he, when he first sees him, he's like bewildered, like what the, you know, <laughs> he's yeah. yeah. So for yeah, me, I great. always like, it's just the, <laughs> the smaller moments like that. I kind of, I kind of really like, and yeah, they didn't mess with that when he, I mean, they cleaned up the Falcon when it leaves, of course, but uh, other than that, it was good. So yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that's going to do it for our celebration of star wars it was oddly enough you know eric might might relate to this or get a kick out of it is you know i have a, a an excel spreadsheet of all the movies and music that we want to do it's i never i never bothered to write star wars down for some reason like it was always one of the first ones we wanted to do but i never i was looking at the list to cross it off i'm like i never even put it on the list because we were just always waiting for it we wanted to kind of wait until the time was right and, yeah. and as we come on our our one year anniversary of launching the podcast, we decided to do some special episodes. Star Wars is, is one of the ones that we we waited to do. And, and Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys is another one that we've waited for our anniversary to do. So uh, couldn't be more happy and pleased that Sean Grady is with us and, and helping Great out. Great to be here. And of course, Nick Leshy as well uh, is going to be you. there. And Always. we're going to throw in just a little... If you're into the Book of Boba Fett, we're going to throw in a little stinger here. The, the four of us are going to be back to do a recap of the Book of Boba Fett series. So if you're into that on Disney+, Plus, you can hear us rant and rave about that as well. And of course, Eric, always uh, always in, in, the, in the other chair with me as well. So thank you all of you guys. We appreciate it. This was such a special evening and, and such a gr- it was great hearing the stories of, of what the film means to you. That, that's really what, what it's about is, yeah. you know, we all carry it with us and we, and Every, a lot of people carry Star Wars, but and they, they carry it for different reasons and different triggers. And, and that, that was really great to hear that. So thank you, everybody. Um, that's going to do it for this episode of 3324 Podcast. You can find us on social media, Instagram and Facebook. We're at 3324 Podcast. If you want to tweet at us, it's 3324P. Join us on our Facebook group, Very Vibrant Activity. There you can post, you can comment, you can have a lot of fun. You can join the conversation. Uh, we, we would look forward uh, to seeing you there. So why don't you join us? Uh, it would be great. Uh, for Sean, for Nick, for Eric, this has been Dean. And we're going to ask you to please get your original edition of Star Wars <laughs> and be kind and please rewind. You've been listening to the 3324 podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 